Perfect. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, uh, thank you, Aiko, for, for the invitation to uh, being part of this of this summit. Um, I'm very happy to be here and to share uh, part of our story. Um, what I would like to discuss with you in the next uh, 20, 30 minutes is how MEMS technology is uh, is being used these days to accelerate the development of uh, electric dialysis. And uh, for us, since we're dealing with MEMS, it all starts at the nanoscale, right? Now, when we think about electrocatalysis at the nanoscale, it's unavoidable to um, not recognize that nanoparticles and overall nanostructure materials have been emerging as ideal platforms uh, to do these kind of studies, right? Because they provide all sort of molecular insights and because they've been helping us in improving uh, the, the efficiency of the electrocatalytical activity. But the same way that uh, we're talking about nanoparticles is unavoidable not to talk about transmission electron microscopy due to the small sizes of these particles that we're dealing with or any other nanostructure material. Now, in this sense, uh, transmission electron microscopes, they are known to be the, the most powerful tools uh, out there so that you can visualize with subatomic resolution um, whatever sample it is that you're interested in. Um, but what, what we know about transmission electron microscopes is that, you know, you introduce a holder with your sample inside of this big column where the electron beam will be going through, but this is at room temperature and this is in high vacuum conditions. So a typical image that you can observe or that you can uh, get with the TEM is something like what you see on the right side, where each of these little dots is an individual atom. But um, to make the, the research uh, more meaningful, ideally would like to step away from these uh, static conditions and enable users to introduce all sort of stimuli so that they can move from this uh, boring static image into an actual dynamic video where they can see real-time dynamics precisely. And that's what you can see here, for example. So you see the sublimation of this uh, row of atoms. Now that's what we refer to as in situ TEM. Now, what we do for, for, uh, to enable in situ TEM is that if you look at the conventional holder, where in the tip of the holder, that's where you place the sample via a conventional three millimeter screen. Well, what we do is we replace this uh, three millimeter screen because that's a static boring sample carrier. And we use a MEMS device instead, instead a microelectromechanical system. Now this MEMS device, is a chip that is uh, equipped with all sort of nano sensors or nano actuators that, that will essentially allow you to start manipulating uh, the molecular structure of your sample um, as a function of different stimuli, as I mentioned. Therefore, this MEMS will be acting as a nanoscale laboratory inside of your TEM. Now, to explain uh, to you the, the typical workflow, to make it a bit uh, more visual, let's say, as I was mentioning, we no longer rely on the copper grids as a sample carrier, but instead on the MEMS device. So the sample, the, the user places a sample on this MEMS device via drop casting using a FIP lamella, they transfer the 2D materials, whatever it is. But of course we need to interface that MEMS device with the user and for that we use this holder, which is a functionalized uh, holder. So as you can see there, we have a pocket where we place the, the MEMS device. Of course, since we have all sort of sensors and actuators that we need to actuate, then we need to create ohmic contact between the MEMS, the contact pads of the MEMS and the electrical needles that we have there. We have some locks uh, to ensure that the MEMS won't fall inside of the TEM column. And for the rest, it's just following conventional uh, conventional uh, workflow uh, steps, which is introducing the holder into the TEM and starting the actual imaging. Now, in this case, since we have a MEMS device, we have also developed our own uh, software so that we can, together with our electronics, start controlling everything. So here you see a, a typical example of a microheater that can go to 1,300 degrees Celsius. And this is a typical example as well of what you can see. So these are gold atoms, and you can see in real time how they evaporate from this cadmium selenide uh, substrate. So this ho hopefully gives you a bit of an idea of the typical workflow that, that we follow when using MEMS to, to enable in situ TM. But when it comes to electrocatalysis or heterogeneous catalysis, you typically want to do this in environmental conditions, so in liquid or in gas. Therefore, the architecture or the structure changes a little bit. Now, what we have to do in this case is, since we want to introduce a, a fluid, let's say gas, for example, um, instead of having the MEMS devices I showed you earlier with purely the microheater, which will be in vacuum, inside the vacuum of the TM column, in this case, we will use two chips 
so that we can sandwich them together and create a closed chamber for this liquid or, or gas to go through. So we have a defined inlet and outlet on the chip. So in this case, we can introduce, for example, the cold gas. It travels through a region of interest where your sample is, where the electron transparent windows are. And there locally, we can control temperature, uh, pressure, gas composition, gas mixture, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, we have the two chips, as I mentioned, to sandwich this, this gas or this liquid. And then, of course, the, the architecture of the holder itself has to change a little bit so that we can compress these two chips. But again, for the rest, um, we just rely on the conventional uh, steps to, to, to do the imaging. Now, before I explain to you how this works, how the technology works, I'll just give you two quick ex examples so you can get a better idea of, of what this technology uh, can be used for. Let's say um, if you're going to be doing experiments in gas environment, Let's say a typical experiment or a typical example in heterogeneous catalysis is precisely with a, a catalyzer, right? Uh, let's say in the internal combustion engines where in the cars you have this catalyzer to make sure that you're not going to be creating these black smogs and start polluting. Uh, the catalyzers, they have all sort of uh, nanoparticles, uh, typically platinum nanoparticles, right? And, and these platinum nanoparticles, these uh, nano catalyzers, they are the ones that are going to be in charge of precisely catalyzing this CO, CO2 uh, conversion to make sure that you, you don't pollute. But for scientists and for engineers who are developing these this catalyzing nanoparticles, they need to understand how can they increase the efficiency of, of, of this catalytic activity. Is it something that is uh, facet dependent, nanoparticle size dependent? Um, what can they do? So. Our, our MEMS technology, what it allows people to do is that you can bring this nanoparticle into our nanoreactor, the MEMS device, and then you can start mimicking completely the same environmental conditions to which this particle would be exposed to in real life situations. You can mimic pressure, temperature, gas composition, whatever it is, and then you can visualize in real time how the particle will actually be uh, working. So you can visualize the, the activation or the deactivation of the catalytic activity. Um, and from this, you can start understanding which is going to be the sweet spot for your catalytic activity to, to, to work uh, at its maximum efficiency, right? So it's a typical example in, in gas. But what about liquid? For example, we've heard that in the past, there, there's been some, some instances where batteries fail. And a typical example was this, this uh, cell phone that was exploding at a given point, right? Um, now, what we know from batteries is that you, you have a cathode and a nanode. And there's a liquid electrolyte in, in between. Um, and sometimes there's these dendrites that grow from, from one side to the other one, creating a short circuit, and that leads to battery failure. So what uh, battery uh, companies can do, for example, is they can use our MEMS device to position the same cathode and anode materials on the MEMS, introduce the same liquid electrolyte, and then start visualizing what is going to happen at a molecular scale on real time. So you can start visualizing, for example, that in this case, there's, there's some electroplating effect going on, but then at a certain point, um, there, there's a dendrite growth. So from here, the electrochemist can start understanding that, okay, the electrochemical environment uh, for, for these batteries is not the ideal. So what can we do to, to further uh, uh, yeah, uh, prevent these issues from happening? So here, what you can do is, uh, you know, you can try to make this reversible. Um, you can start manipulating the electrochemical conditions, as I said, and then figure out what is the best way to optimize your, your battery design. So this gives you a bit of a, an idea of, of the type of things that can be done uh, with, uh, with this technology. Now, let's stay in, in the liquid uh, phase regime, because that's where most electrochemistry is, is taking place when using our technology. When doing liquid phase microscopy, there's all sort of uh, challenges that people have been historically facing. And that's the fact that it is very difficult to control the, the liquid thickness. You have a certain liquid layer with a certain pressure, but it, there's vacuum outside. So unavoidably, these electron transparent windows, they will start bulging, increasing your liquid thickness. And that not only affects your high imaging uh, resolution uh, possibilities, but you won't be able to perform analytical uh, experiments or, or spectroscopical analysis, let's say, using EELS, electron diffraction, EDS. Um, it's very difficult to control the, the environmental uh, situation around your sample, the flow, the pressure. We know that there are some undesired uh, electron beam effects. The moment the electron beam hits the liquid, there is a radiolysis process that is triggered, leading to the formation of all sort of chemical radicals that can affect your sample, 
bubble formation, all sort of things that affect your flexibility. So this is precisely what we can now address with uh, our technology. Now, this particular system that you see here, the stream system, um, is a system for liquid phase microscopy to do electrochemistry, among other things. So what you see is, again, the, the nanocells or the MEMS device, which I will show you in detail later on, the holder, which is the interface, the potential stat to, to enable electrochemistry, and then, for example, the, the fluidic uh, pump. We can also do liquid heating, uh, by the way. But let's start going piece by piece so that you can understand the, the, the technology a little bit better. On the holder side of things, as you can see, we have some uh, valves that allow uh, people to lock uh, a little bit of uh, electrolyte uh, if you want to work in study conditions. Um, everything is digitally controlled anyway, but also the reason to have these manual valves is that if you're dealing with uh, air sensitive uh, samples, you can also close it to prevent uh, any issues there. And if you look at the tip of the holder, as I had shown you before, one nice thing that, that the system has is this modularity, which means that at any point in time, you can completely disassemble the entire architecture so that you can replace the inner tubing to prevent, uh, prevent cross uh, contamination or clogging. The tip, you can uh, wash it or you can put in a sonicator to do thorough washing. And of course, the MEMS device is, is a consumable. Uh, now, the MEMS device itself, that's of course where all the magic, sort of speaking, uh, takes place. Now, uh, for the sake of electrochemistry, our MEMS device, uh, and, and just as I had shown uh, before, consists on a top and a bottom chip. So two chips that we sandwich together, where on the bottom chip, that's where we have the, the standard three electro configuration uh, to perform electrochemistry. So we, we of course have the working electrode, the reference electrode, the counter one. We can offer different materials uh, for this. Um, and, and we of course uh, encapsulate everything for, for the sake of signal to noise ratio. So when you close it off with, uh, with the top chip, then what happens is that we create a very well-defined fluidic path for the electrolyte to go through. So the electrolyte will be going through the inlet going through this very well-defined fluidic channel all the way to the outlet. And as you can see here, crossing the region of interest, which is where your sample will be, where the electrodes are, and where the electron beam of the transmission electron microscope will be passing through. Now, the, the important thing here to, to highlight is precisely that well-defined uh, fluidic channel um, that, that allows us to do uh, the, the, the final control on the, on the fluidics. So this is given by this inlet and outlet that are directly on the chip, surrounded by this spacer, as you can see here. So what happens is that when you place uh, the, the top chip above the surface of this spacer, then we create this closed chamber and we force the liquid to go from inlet to outlet via, as I mentioned, the region of interest. Now, to explain to you the, the importance of this fluidic channel a little bit more, uh, let me start by quickly showing you how our old liquid system used to look like. Um, now, what you see here is this flower-shaped pocket structure where you can see that there's also a top and a bottom chip, but the inlet and the outlet, instead of being on chip, as I just showed you, they used to be on the tip itself. So here you see the inlet and the outlet. So this is a concept that is typically referred to as a bathtub design. And this bathtub design is what every other competing system out there in the market is, is relying on. So what is the big issue with this uh, bathtub design? That when you introduce your electrolyte, um, for, for, uh, as a matter of fact, the electrolyte, what it would do is it will first fill in this pocket structure and only once it is filled, uh, then by diffusion, the electrolyte will start going in between your two chips to reach the, the electron transparent window of your MEMS. But this is diffusion control. And you see, if you're introducing nanoparticles, for the most of it, you're gonna be bypa bypassing your, your chips so this is of, of no use, of course. So that means that you're not going to have any sort of proper control uh, over, over the, the fluidic situation in, around your sample, right? You, you cannot control flow. You cannot control pressure. You cannot control the, the, the direction uh, of the liquid. You don't know where the liquid will be coming uh, from. And as I mentioned, this is a big issue that limits all sort of possibilities for researchers. And this is what we learned from this old system that we used to have. And once again, this is what all uh, competing systems are still suffering from. Now, in our case, we have now this stream system where, as I showed you, we have on-chip inlet and outlet directly on the MEMS. The inlet and the outlet of our MEMS device is directly, uh, they're directly aligned with the inlet and outlet of the tip. So what we do is we introduce the electrolyte 
and we force it to go from inlet to outlet via the region of interest. Now, the interesting thing here, once again, is uh, the well-defined fluidic channel that we have in our MEMS device, but also very importantly, the fact that we can independently control, and that's the, the important thing to remember here, we can independently control the pressure at the inlet and the pressure at the outlet. So we can have positive pressure here to push the, the electrolyte, negative pressure here to pull it, for example. So we, we have this pressure-driven flow. And because we can control the absolute pressure of this fluidic channel, not only we enable this pressure-driven flow, but if I make a reference to this schematic at the very beginning, we will be controlling the pressure of the liquid, and therefore we can manipulate the bulging of these membranes. So if we can control the bulging of the membranes, that means that we are in control of our liquid thickness. So we can enable very high resolution uh, imaging in liquid, and, and we can prevent uh, all sort of uh, beam broadening effects. Now, uh, conventional systems, competing systems, they rely on syringe pump, where the only thing you do is you control the, the speed of the stepper motor that pushes the, the liquid via the syringe. In our case, as I mentioned, uh, we're controlling the pressure. So that means that we uh, benefit from a much higher stability and a much faster uh, response time. So if we uh, sum it up, uh, what you encounter is something like this. So we have the, the holder where in the tip of the of the holder, that's where we place the, the MEMS device, the MEMS device, which is completely aligned to the inlet and the outlet of the of the holder um, so that we can control the, the flow. If we have a closer look to the architecture of the MEMS device, as I mentioned, we rely on a top and a bottom chip, the top chip, which is where we have, of course, the top window, a groove so that we can place this O-ring for safety purposes to prevent liquid going into the TM column and the bottom uh, chip, which is the one that contains the inlet, the outlet surrounded by the spacer to create the well-defined fluidic channel. So as I mentioned, we can independently control the pressure at the inlet, we can control the pressure at the outlet, and by, by doing this, we can enable this pressure-driven uh, flow, which in real life um, looks as you will see it now. So as a matter of fact, what we can do is we can go from static uh, conditions to dynamic flows, where as you can see here, we can go from very low flow rates to very fast flow rates. We can control the entire thing over, over the region of interest. And because we are controlling the flow so accurately with our MEMS device over the region of interest, as a matter of fact, what we're doing, and here's where the sample is, we are controlling the mass transport. And if you can control the mass transport, then that means that you can control the kinetics of, of your reaction. And therefore, you can really start uh, manipulating uh, the, the the chemical routes uh, that you want to have for your for your uh, electrochemical experiments. So this is precisely a video showing showing that. Where, as you can see, there's there's a, a certain flow, and and when we change the flow, if we start increasing or decreasing the flow, you see that immediately uh, the response in the CV curve changes. So you can see that we are quite sensitive uh, to, to any change in flow precisely because we are manipulating or, or controlling the mass transport and therefore the, the kinetics. So I'll just fast forward a little bit so you can see it a bit faster. So you see we start decreasing the flow. You, you see the, the change on the, on the CV curve and any change that we perform in flow and therefore in mass transport will see its effect on the, on the CV curve. So again, we are the only ones uh, in the market that can allow you to control the kinetics of your reaction um, at this at this level. Now, um, with the level of control that we have, there's all sort of things that you can do. You can completely control the way uh, the liquid will go in or go out. So what you can see here, it's an empty MEMS device. Uh, we can corroborate that with EELS. Here it's filled with liquid. That's why you see the difference in contrast corroborated by EELS. And whenever you want, you can start emptying the nanocell. So here you see the border between having liquid and no liquid until it is empty again. So because we can control the liquid very accurately and the thickness, we can also achieve very high resolutions. So what you see here is a dendrite that was electrochemically grown, copper dendrite. And you see that for a liquid thickness of 100 nanometers, here we can see nicely the fringes. So we have resolutions of 2.1 angstroms in liquid. Um, and because we can achieve these very high resolutions, then that means that we can stay below the beam broadening effects and that allows us to do all sort of uh, spectroscopical uh, analysis. So here we can see elemental mapping, so EDS. Again, you can see nicely the copper signal of the dendrite, platinum of the elect uh, electrode. We can do EELS, 
where here you see the sample in dry state and liquid. That's why you see the difference in, in contrast again. And we can monitor the, the, the shift of the peaks, the splitting, denoting the strong interactions between the water molecules and the, and the sample. Yes. To make sure we pass the 20 minutes. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm about to. I'm about to finish. Yes. Great. And um, and then of course the the possibility to do uh, a electron diffraction. So with all this, just to wrap it up, uh, what are some typical examples that that you can achieve? Things that you can do? Well, you can you can control the the reactions uh, as I mentioned uh, in such way that you can, for example, using a one part solution phase synthesis. You can define uh, the shape of the particle that you would like to synthesize. So this is uh, all of them are silver. So you see, we can have cubic particles, triangular uh, wires. Um, we can we can, uh, for example, uh, control or look into morphological changes of a catalyst during hydrogen evolution reaction. Where uh, just to speed it up quickly, here we have some fiber uh, nanowires, and then um, by controlling the chemical uh, environment. You can see what the initial and the and the final state would be after this uh, hydrogen evolution reaction, or uh, we can uh, do electrochemical uh, synthesis in situ of uh, nanoparticles. Where what you can do is you can first uh, create all sort of random shapes, but then if you control the potential within a certain window, you can keep only uh, the particle uh, with the facet that you desire. And then upon that, what you can start doing is also to do further studies uh, of uh, morphological changes, for example, on, on this particle. Um, so with this, I would like to uh, to finalize, not before uh, um, yeah, acknowledging everybody who has been part of this, uh, of this research and this development. And with that, I would like to uh, thank you for, for the attention. And of course, uh, if there's any question, I'll be, I'll be happy to, uh, to answer. Thanks, uh, Hugo. Thanks for again a uh, very nice overview of what is possible by using uh, next generation MEMS chips. So again, the floor is open for some questions. Uh, feel free to just uh, unmute. Uh, let's hope that we don't unmute all at the same time. Um, if you have any specific question. In the meantime, I will just start with the initial question that I also said to um, the previous speaker. So I also see that you are developing quite a lot of uh, nice uh, software to make um, the experimental work more automated and more reproducible and to, to store a lot of the valuable insights that coming out of this uh, research. Right. Are you also active in, in let's say, facilitating this, this sharing of data? Is that something that you are working on? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, as a matter of fact, one of the things that we're doing is um, just just to give an example, right? Um, we we have uh, realized that uh, when doing in situ experiments, in this case, we have encountered uh, several types of uh, customers who also like to take it one step further, and they like to, uh, for example, customize it by by doing their own uh, Python scripts and so on. So one of the things that we've done is uh, we've created a repository where uh, we are developing all sort of uh, scripts as well. Um, so, so that we can, uh, you know, it's open source and, and, and we can help uh, customers in better shaping their, their, uh, their experiments. Um, but overall, we, we are, we're certainly very open in, in making sure that we can make this uh, knowledge and, 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 uh, and these capabilities as, um, yeah, accessible to everyone as possible. Um, so yeah, that is, that is certainly something that we're working on. Great. Any questions from uh, the audience? If possible, I would have a question. I'm Josef Romondi from Autolab. Hi, good afternoon. Yeah, of Hello. course. Uh, it's, you, you, you mentioned that uh, you can uh, basically control the mass transport based right. on, uh, on different flow rates and so on. Is there already a quantitative correlation between these? So something like uh, Levitch equation for the RDE measurements. I'm not. I don't know if you are familiar. We, uh, I, I know what you what you uh, refer. Yeah, what you're referring to. Uh, we're still actually quantifying this much more. Uh, at this at this moment, what we have are uh, yeah results like this, where basically what we can what we can see is the effect on the CV curve as a function of the different uh, flow rates that, that we're dealing with. 
Um, but indeed, one of the, the things that we're actively working on is on quantifying this uh, mass transport control uh, much more. So, so if this is something where where um, where you know, we're, we're we're always very open for for collaborations. If if this is something that you guys are interested in, um, this perhaps could be a very interesting topic to uh, to work on. But uh, yes, at this moment we're we're trying to quantify this much more. At this moment, uh, these are the type of results uh, that we are uh, that we can yeah offer for the time being. All right. Thanks. Uh, we we can continue offline maybe separately and sure, sure, uh, absolutely. Get, get, get in touch and I'll be, I'll be happy share, share some details. Okay, thanks. Absolutely. I think this is a very great example of why we think this summit is so valuable. Um, different stakeholders supplying uh, tools to researchers to help them speeding up, and now the suppliers are collaborating with each other to even integrate the solutions even more, um, and provide better solutions. Um, so that's also why I'm very happy that we have this summit today um, and that we can share the knowledge among each other um, and really uh, try to make a big leap forward. Um, any last question before we will move to the next speaker? So again, feel free to unmute yourself, maybe do a short introduction. Uh, who you are. Um, I see one hand being raised. Just unmute yourself. Hello, my name is Reza from Duke University. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. Uh, I had a question about uh, uh, this uh, reactor design. Yes. I know that what is the state of uh, art, uh, the state of art of this design that is made to improve the, the flow reactor? What, what is the state of what? Sorry, I, I couldn't hear you at the end. I mean, that's, uh, what is the design, the, the novelty of this reactor to improve the flow, flow reactor? I mean, I mean the, so the, the, the MEMS device, you mean this? Yes, this one. So the, the, first of all, uh, the having on-chip inlet and outlet, uh, this is something that, as I mentioned, uh, we're the only ones who, who have this. So this is a patent that we have. All of our competitors, um, as I had mentioned uh, in, in their systems, the inlet and the outlet are directly on the tip, not on the MEMS device, not on the reactor. This is something that we used to, to, to do or to have in the past. But as I said, we, we learned that this is not the way to go. So, um, so basically what we have in the, in the nano cell, as we call it, so, so the reactor, is first of all uh, this on-chip inlet and outlet that together with the spacer, it um, it creates this well-defined fluidic path, and then there's of course uh, the novelty that comes by combining this well-defined fluidic uh, path with the with the electrode uh, design. Now for the electrodes, we we have different materials, um, and then one of the things that we benefit from is that from the materials that we have. Um, and from the design where, for example, here you see the counter electrode is closer to, uh, to the outlet, we can make sure that we can flush all these uh, unwanted products that are formed uh, easier, faster. And then, of course, the fact that um, if unwanted, uh, let's say, bubbles are formed, which is also one of the big novelties of our MEMS device, if a, if a bubble is formed and, and bubble formation is, is, is intrinsic to doing liquid phase microscopy, uh, because you know, due to radiolysis, you can have can have hydrolysis, right? Uh, a bubble is formed. The 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 temperature gradients of the beam can form also a bubble. So thanks to the to the formation uh, or thanks to the to the design that we have on our on our MEMS device, if if a bubble is formed uh, on the region of interest, as you can see here, we can easily flush it away. Um, because the MEMS device enables us to, to do that uh, fluid control. But sometimes it could be that you're not uh, interested in flushing away the bubble because you would increase the, the fluid, uh, the flow rate, and you might be scared of, of flushing away your, your sample. But in that case, we can also dissolve the bubble. So that's another uh, benefit that, that the reactor or the MEMS device enables you to do. I need to uh, stop you here, Yuho. Thanks again for mentioning the great uh, advantages of your, your design. Um, also, thanks for the question uh, coming from the audience. Um, 
thanks again, Hugo. Um, Thank and, you. Um, uh, good luck with all the developments and uh, looking forward to uh, sharing new updates uh, on the next Material Pioneer Summit. Uh,